Detective is brought to you by CrimeFeed.com. You crave a good mystery, and CrimeFeed.com is your 24-7 source for getting your fix. From criminals behaving badly to the most absurd crimes of our time, CrimeFeed brings you the real story. CrimeFeed.com. Due to the graphic nature of the content, Detective may not be suitable for all audiences. He beat his wife to death with a soda bottle and never broke the bottle. The first blow produces blood. The second blow disperses it. You look at the ceiling, you count the tracks. I stopped counting at 60. He's sitting there with his eyes this big, eyes big as silver dollars, glassy-eyed. And he looks at me, and he has this really faraway look, and he says, did I hurt her? In episode three, Lieutenant Kenda talked about the three motives for murder, money, sex, and revenge. I'm Garnsey Sloan for Investigation Discovery, and this is Detective. True stories from behind the yellow tape, the ones you don't hear on TV. On this episode, Lieutenant Kenda talks about sex as the motive and the many different types of murder cases it influences, from marital infidelity to sexual predators. The strongest human instinct is to survive. You will fight or flight. I mean, you will try to live no matter what. The second strongest instinct is the sex drive. Very powerful, okay? If it gets misconstrued, misdirected, somehow misunderstood, then it becomes a very dangerous thing. You have cases involving sexual infidelity when an actual event occurs and someone discovers it. Discovers evidence of it, discovers it while it's underway. All sorts of things happening there that drive it. With sex as a motive, Lieutenant Kenda explains how the most common murders stem from domestic violence. Women don't understand the warning signs of someone who is going to kill them. It's a progressive event. If you abuse a female verbally, you will then do it physically and you will eventually kill her. That's a reality. Domestic violence cases very often lead to murder. Usually the accusations begin by the abuser you're having sex with other men. You're dating people. You're out and about. You're shaming me. It's all part of that abusive personality and uh, laying guilt or trying to lay guilt on the person until it reaches the point of explosion and she is killed as a result of a perception of sexual infidelity. Whether you like that or not, whether you think you're going to change him, whether you think he loves you, no, he doesn't. The only thing that matters to him is him. And you don't matter at all. Not at all. Those warning signs start to pop. It's time for you to pack a bag. Or you're going to become a statistic. Very difficult for people to do. They lose their sense of self-worth. They lose their sense of self-respect. They become diminished. They begin to believe it's their fault. That's why they're getting abused. That he's right. That I do bad things. And all the stuff that goes with that that eventually will lead to you being murdered if you don't get out of there. It's reality. So that's the most common example of sex as a motive. And the abuser uses sex as a weapon, a way to threaten, a way to accuse, a way to punish. Here, Lieutenant Kenda describes how the laws about murder treat these crimes of passion. You have infidelity cases where the husband comes home unexpectedly. And the wife is not alone, and trouble begins, and somebody dies. Those kinds are the ultimate crime of passion. In the law, the crime of second-degree murder says, among its other attributes, there are other sections to it as well, but there's one section that clearly describes the infidelity case, okay, where the victim engages in behavior that is so highly provoking to the perpetrator so dramatically provoking. There is insufficient time for the voice of reason to be heard. Passion overcomes judgment and a death results. Second degree murder. That's really designed for the unexpected return of the husband or the unexpected return of the wife. 
who comes home and finds the husband in bed with someone, and the gunfire tends to begin. It is truly an emotional killing. It's immediate. There's no forethought. There's no anything. But that's really what that portion of the law is reserved for. It's so common, they have that specific application in second-degree murder. An irresistible rise of passion in the perpetrator brought on by this highly provoking act on the part of the victim. And that's really what they're talking about. Sexual infidelity in its most purest, most obvious form in my presence. I didn't hear about this. I'm looking at it. All right. Pretty highly provoking. Lieutenant Kenda describes several cases of how caught in the act marital infidelity can lead to murder. You have the triangle affair. I can't be without him. I can't be without her. I've never had sex that good in my life. I can't give that up. So you're going to kill for that? Well, well, yeah. I have a, a, a city worker comes home from work. He's not supposed to come home from work. He hears noise in the bedroom. He enters the bedroom. He discovers why it's so noisy in here. And it's his wife cavorting with her boyfriend. They both look quite shocked. He keeps a gun in the bedroom to protect the family from intruders. He becomes the intruder. He grabs that gun and he starts shooting. He kills her. He wounds the guy. He empties the gun. He would have continued to shoot, probably, but he ran out of bullets. He waited for the police to arrive. He was so overcome by the moment. Another guy comes home. He works midnights. He goes to work, and he realizes he's forgotten his identification. And where he works, it requires photo ID to get in. Very secure facility. He's a highly placed guy, very good job. But he realizes, I can't go to work. I don't have my ID, his badge and everything he requires. So he, he goes back home. His wife is upstairs in bed, which he thinks is very odd because she was downstairs in the kitchen when he left. She looks nervous. And he puts two and two together. And in his employment, he carries a gun. He has a gun in his hip. He opens a closet. Here stands this guy who happens to be naked and doesn't seem to have a good explanation. This guy draws his piece and empties it into this guy. Just empties it. Fortunately for her, he emptied it. Or I think he'd have turned it on her as well. But he shot this guy seven times in this closet. Which was all the bullets he had. Given the fact he was two feet away, he never missed. This guy was dead before he hit the floor. She runs screaming out of the room while he's lighting up the inside of this closet with muzzle flashes. And he waits for the police to arrive. He's sitting on the stairs with a gun between his feet when the first officers get there. And he looks at the first officer, very calm. He says, I don't have another gun. That's the gun right there. They take the gun. They, they handcuff him. Tells him. I forgot my ID. I needed ID for my work. I carry a gun, which he does every day. I had to come back home and get it. I knew something was up. I opened a closet and I see this naked guy. I just started blasting. Very matter of fact. Now, Lieutenant Kenda describes a disturbing story where in this crime of passion, the weapon was a nearby heavy object, a glass bottle. I had a guy who collected soda bottles. People made soda bottles at one time out of very heavy glass. They were glass. They were heavy, they were thick, and they were very hard to damage. That was the point. He had hundreds of them. He beat his wife to death with one of those when she was with her boyfriend. The boyfriend escaped. He went out the, the literally the back window. He dives naked out of the house, out of the second floor window, survived the fall hit the ground running, and ran naked through the neighborhood uh, until somebody found him. He beat her to death with a soda bottle and never broke the bottle. You could not recognize her. He hit her in excess, the coroner said, in excess of 100 times. He was covered in blood, literally soaked in blood, head to foot, 
everyday guy sold insurance. This moment overcame him. When I get there, uniforms are already there. They already have him handcuffed. I go look at the victim in bed, and it is a mess. The first blow produces blood. The second blow disperses it. There are tracks on the ceiling, cast off blood from that pop bottle. You look at the ceiling, you count the tracks. I stopped counting at 60. That gives you how many blows. He's sitting there with his eyes this big, eyes big as silver dollars, glassy-eyed. And he looks at me, and he has this really faraway look, and he says, did I hurt her? Oh, yeah, you hurt her. Is she going to be okay? No, she's not. He had no idea what he'd done. He was completely and totally overcome by the emotion of the moment and used the only weapon he had, which was a soda bottle. And he beat her to death because of sexual infidelity. We have an Air Force officer who is married. He has a wife who he suspects might be having an affair. He discovers he's exactly correct when he comes home one day, unexpectedly, and the affair is underway. Same story. Gun in the house, only he killed them both. And then called the police himself. I asked Lieutenant Kenda if women are ever the killers. We had uh, more than one woman has reacted precisely the same way when she came home unexpectedly and discovered that hubby was not alone. And out came the family shotgun, or out came the baseball bat, and they attack. They attack the husband. They leave the woman alone. It's interesting, but they don't touch the woman. Just the husband. It's like they don't blame the woman. It's rather odd. In men killing, they kill everybody. Everybody's in the room. The guy, the guy, everybody. Women don't. They attack the one they think is responsible, which is the male. The woman gets to be a witness. I had a woman once who was in bed with this husband when the wife comes in the door with the Louisville slugger and proceeds to take him over the right field wall. And I asked this one that's in bed, who's sitting there in a borrowed robe because she's naked, What happened? Did you see what happened? No, I covered myself with a blanket when she came in. Why'd you do that? I didn't want her to see who I was. Even that is insane. She's gonna allow you to leave without ever looking at you? I mean, what are you doing? But it's the emotion on every side, the witness's emotion. I'm gonna hide myself. Like no one's gonna see this big bump under the blanket, you know? while the man's being murdered next to her. And that girl knew how to swing a bat. Massive traumatic injury. Because she is wild. And she is doing what humans do when they become wild. I've had women come home, go find a gun, come back into the room, gun in the house, and come back in the room and open fire. But always they shoot the man. He's the focus, not the female. It's interesting. Men don't do that. They shoot everybody. Man, woman, everybody. Lieutenant Kenda explains why people caught in these situations react in this way. These are people who are not supposed to do this behavior, but they are people. And they become overwhelmed by the emotions of the moment. The opportunity and a weapon presents itself, be it a soda bottle or a gun. You see these events occur in sexual crimes that involve people from every spectrum of society. People who are well-educated, people who are well-employed, upper middle class, to even wealthy families, doesn't make any difference. Lovely homes, good jobs, no issue involving money, no drugs, nothing. Sex. Sex that's not considered appropriate. And therein lies the trouble. With sex as the motive, there are also those rare killers, sexual predators. Here, Lieutenant Kenda describes how he got one to confess his crime. 
I had a guy, a really crazy guy. He's a sexual predator. He is a dangerous, dangerous guy because there's more than one person in him. There is an everyday person who is married and has a daughter, works in a family business, perfectly legitimate guy. Everybody likes the guy, goes to church every Sunday. But there's something in him that nobody knows about. He has a dream of attacking women and raping them and killing them. He's able to carry on his life, but he's really crazy. And he finally decides his dream has to live. He has to make this happen. Now, what better victim than a prostitute? There's no kidnapping involved. You pull up on a corner and she opens the door and gets in. It's very convenient if you're that kind of a person. He takes her up in the mountains. He does unspeakable things to her. And then he goes home. He thinks she dies. She should have. She survived. Staggered out, covered in blood the next morning. They treat her medically. She's able to talk to us. She knows a lot about him. She paid attention to his truck and what kind of, what he looked like and so on and so forth. We find him. I find evidence concealed in his bedroom. He's the guy. Because one of the things he did is he cut off her hair as a souvenir. Cut her head hair off and kept it. Concealed in his dresser, and I find it. And it's hers. He is in tears in my office for hours. How could you possibly think I did this? I love my wife. I love my child. I go to work every day. I go to church on Sundays. How can you think I could do something horrible like this? And I know he did do this. I want to talk to the other guy that's in him. And I can't, I see flashes of him, but I don't, I don't, I'm not talking to him. And I'm approaching the limit of the interrogation time. There is no specific magic time. The general rules about six or eight hours and you're pretty well done. You better be concluding this or... You're going to be pressing the envelope. And I'm almost there, and I've run out of things to say. And I said, you know, what do you like to think about every day? What do you mean? Well, people have favorite dreams. They think about being an athletic hero. They think about marrying a movie star. They think about having a lot of money. What do they like to think about? What's your favorite dream? And his whole demeanor changed, and his head went sideways, and he said, oh, I can't tell you that. Here's that guy. Here's that mysterious guy. Why not? You, you'll, you'll get mad at me? No, I won't. Oh, you, you, you'll get mad. No, you can tell me. You won't, you won't tell me anything I haven't heard before. And he holds my hand because he's getting excited that the idea of telling me what he likes to think about. He's starting to shake. He's starting to sweat. He said, I like to think about making love to women in their own blood while they're dying. Don't you like to think about that? Whew. Critical moment. And I said, well, yeah, I do. you do? Now we're kindred souls. I wanted to take a shower after I talked to that guy. But he told me everything. But the scariest thing he said to me at the end, he said, because he knew. We had her, and she was alive. And he said, but you know what? What? I won't make that mistake again. Next time, I'll make sure she's dead. Well, the good news, my boy, in your case, there isn't going to be a next time. So the sexual predator is a rare bird, but they're exceedingly dangerous because they're in this twilight between reality and psychosis all the time. Where are you today? Are you in reality? Or are you having a psychotic episode? You know, what is going on with you right now? Those people are very few and far between, but they're out there. So they are purely motivated by sex. It is a sexual crime achieving gratification in a very twisted way 
unlike other people who engage in sex, they engage in activity that gives them a euphoric sensation of sex, driven by this mental disturbance that thinks this is all what women should do for them. It is really incredible, and it's very, very spooky. And you think, how did you ever get to be? Why are you out here among us? When you get somebody like this and you're able to lock them away forever, which we certainly did with him, you've accomplished something today. You've had a good day. You took somebody off the street who isn't going to hurt anybody else. He's not. Because you saw to it that he's not going to. And that's why you do this work. That's why you do the work. Detective is produced by Investigation Discovery, with special thanks to Kevin Bennett, Amy Angelowitz, and Emily Kaiser. Many thanks to the best audio engineer in the business, the mighty Joe Powers. Original music was composed by the talented Chris Kennedy. Cover art was designed by Anon Galat. Sign up now at iTunes to get Detective on your feed. And join me, Garnsey Sloan, every week for a new episode. Next time on Detective. Revenge killings are almost always premeditational because it's a building of emotion. A general plan begins to form. You're not reacting to the passion of the moment. You're not reacting to some highly provoking act on the part of the victim. You are considering, you are calculating, you are mad, and you're getting madder by the minute. You are truly engaging in first-degree murder. <laughs>